Hi everyone, what you're about to see is part one of a two-part series discussing Japan with Alida Tosh. This interview was so good and so interesting, however, so long that we decided to chop it into two parts. So this is part one and part two will be aired in a few weeks. Enjoy! Hello and welcome back to Sigma TV. Our return guest is Alida Tosh, Managing Director at 28 Limited, a Hong Kong-based consultancy specializing in casinos and integrated resorts around the world. Aladad has held senior level positions with gaming companies such as Las Vegas and Macau since 2000. And we've done two interviews with him over the past couple of months, and we'll be featuring him on a monthly basis moving forward. So, Aladad, welcome back. Um, hi, Yanni. Good to see you from you again. It's an honor. It's a pleasure. We've covered Macau in August and September, but today we're changing the subject and tackle rather the forthcoming gaming industry in Japan. And for years, we've heard about the casinos over there. Leading analysts have also predicted that it will be a big market, which leads me to my first question, if you agree. Um, yes, I agree that Japan will be a very large market. Um, and that's because um, Japan is uh, a, a few factors. Number one, Japan is the world's third largest economy, uh, only behind the US and China. It's at $5.2 trillion in 2019 in uh, GDP. Um, it is also the third largest in terms of the number of high net worth individuals, um, which is defined as those with uh, at least a million dollars in liquid um, assets. Um, on a per capita basis, its number of high net worth individuals is actually eight times larger than China. Uh, so Japan has a lot of rich people. Japan has a very, very healthy middle class. And as a result, it has a lot of disposable income. Uh, the Japanese do not actually have legal casinos, although that is just a loophole. In reality, they have a huge pachinko market, which um, is larger than most regular casino markets around the world. Well, you mentioned pachinko parlors, uh, and for those our audience who may not be aware, could you state what pachinko parlors are? Yes, uh, pachinko uh, is kind of difficult to explain uh, for someone who's actually not seen this. Imagine a pinball, an old-fashioned pinball machine where you, you have these steel balls or mar marbles where um, you shoot them and, you know, you, in the old days, I don't know, most of the people are actually quite young, maybe they, they don't remember this, but imagine a bunch of balls jumping around, dozens of these balls jumping around in a pinball and bouncing around in trying to go ahead and hit some kind of a jackpot. Add a video screen to it. And... You walk into a very busy, in a regular, uh, busy place in, in Japan, and you see an arcade, uh, some kind of a parlor where there's maybe three, four hundred of these machines. It is perhaps the loudest place you will voluntarily go to, and I'm not exaggerating. It is loud. It is colorful, too colorful. It is a very sense, much sensory overload. You walk in, you put your money down, and they give you a bucket, a huge bucket, full of these little tiny, tiny balls, steel balls, where you would feed the machine. You walk in there, you, using your skill, you're going to basically go ahead and, you know, trigger the, the, the spring and these, these, these balls shoot up and you get points. At the end of your session, let's say you play 45 minutes and you came in and you, you bought, um, I don't know, 10,000 yen worth of uh, these balls. At the end of your session, let's say you happen to be lucky and you have 15,000 such, you would think, in a typical casino, you would be able to go and redeem that for the additional 5,000 yen that you actually receive, and you'd walk home a minute, but that is not the case. What you get, depending on how well and how successful you are, what you actually end up receiving is sometimes a teddy bear, sometimes a little coupon, and that's it. And you're like, I'm sorry, uh, again, first timer says, what do I do with this? I put money in and I expect some money, and they're like, sorry, we cannot tell you. Um, and you're like, whatever, but I, why do I get my winning? What happens? And they're like, well, you know, we can't tell you, but you can follow somebody to see what happens. And basically you have to, again, I'm not exaggerating this. You have to basically follow someone, maybe down the street or a couple of shops down, or maybe down the street and turn to the left. And you go to a completely different entity, which takes that little coupon that you've received or the teddy bear that they've given you, and they redeem it for cash. Mm -hmm. Through this loophole, they've managed to go ahead and have this industry. Now you would think that's very unusual, it's loud, it's got these balls that you have to carry, these buckets that you have to carry, it's inconvenient to cash out, and yet 
the size of the market is astounding. Mm -hmm. Take the second largest gaming market in the world, the Las Vegas Strip. That's six and a half billion dollars that they won last year. Add to it Manila and add to it uh, uh, Singapore, the third and fourth largest market. Together, they made, they, the casinos there won $15 billion. What Japan did through these pachinko parlors last year, through 10,000 pachinko parlors and uh, 4.2 million such slot machines, they won 30 billion US dollars. Yes, a billion with a B in US dollars. And That's they're crazy. saying that they don't have a casino. So just imagine, inconvenient, very awkward, not exactly the greatest of all locations. There's no elegance. It's just loud. If yep. that does 30 billion, just imagine what an IR would do. Exactly. There's no question yeah. that a typical IR will be, or integrated resort, will be absolutely successful. That's a very thorough. You painted a picture of Pachingo Parlors through your words and appreciate it. And going back to IRs, why does everybody use the term IR when discussing this casinos in Japan? What's an IR exactly? IR is short for the word integrated resort. And it is the way by which companies or politicians sell the idea of a casino. Instead of having a standalone casino, you want to go ahead and incorporate it within an integrated resort, which features hotel rooms, um, meetings, exhibitions, shopping, restaurants, bars, lounge, sometimes an arena, all these different things in addition to a casino. So it's just imagine a huge multiplex where everyone gathers. And what the politicians are saying is, no, 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 we're not bringing a casino. We're bringing an integrated resort, which as part of it has a casino. We will be able to generate money, not just through gaming, but through non-gaming as well. And they do generate significant amount of money on a non-gaming business. Mm -hmm. This is the way they go around and saying the evil of casino gambling actually is mitigated or it brings in so much more benefits and so much more taxing opportunities that collectively, if it's done responsibly, um, collectively, it's a fantastic bargain. So they keep using the word IR because the word casino has negative connotations. Exactly. And what has already been approved by Japan? Well, this has been a long battle that's uh, progressed for quite some time. Um, you know, this has been probably the first time it was mentioned was about 15 years ago. But over the last seven, eight years, there's been a lot of push. And two years ago in 2018, they were able to go ahead and make, meet and resolve some of the uncertainties as to what law has actually been passed. So the first thing that they've actually determined is that the first round, there will be three cities. All of Japan will have three cities or three integrated resorts. The cities have not been determined. And these three cities will have a seven year exclusivity period so that the second round will feature anywhere from one to X number of casinos that has yet to be determined. But at least for the first seven years, they will actually have their own, um, you know, quote unquote, monopoly. Um, they've also determined that the maximum area of an integrated resort, the same wonderful word IR, um, the maximum floor area that the casino can consume of this whole integrated resort is only 3%. So what they're saying is 97% is good, 3% is a kind of, uh, you know, it's not the greatest thing in the world. They've also addressed a lot of the questions, and this actually happened exactly in Singapore, which had the same challenges. It was a, a lot of people did not like the idea of bringing casinos, and they basically um, you know, calmed some of the fears down by actually uh, uh, taxing, uh, the, the, creating an entry fee for Japanese nationals. So if you're Japanese, for you to walk into a casino, you're required to pay 60, 000, sorry, 6,000 yen, which is around, 57 US dollars or around 49 uh, euros. And that is the fee lot. you have to pay to play within a 24 hour period. They've also further limited the number of visits you can have to maximum three times a week and maximum 10 times a month. So they've put limits to basically discourage people who just happen to be walking around and check this out and perhaps fall into this gaming. So really hardcore people are willing to go ahead and pay and paying, you know, uh, it's not a significant amount of money, but it's, it's large enough for a 
non, a casual gamer may not actually be really interested in doing that. This has well, worked well in Singapore quite successfully, and this is the model that they're following. And finally, the last thing that they've decided is that they're going to impose a 30% tax. 30% is quite large. Uh, Las Vegas, the tax is just under 7%. Um, in Manila, in Singapore, the, tax, the, the, the gaming tax uh, you know, varies between 10, 15, maybe 20%. 30% is large. It's not as large as Macau's 39%, but 30% is quite hefty. And again, that is how the Japan is actually trying to win over public support by saying these will actually generate significant amounts, amounts of money. And what big items have, haven't been decided yet? Um, again, big questions remain. Uh, the biggest one, uh, actually, there's, there's four big ones. The first one is nobody still knows what is the percentage of foreign ownership. Can a foreign company from the United States, like Wynn, like MGM, like, like the Las Vegas Sands, or a couple of the big companies in Macau come in there and assume and have 80% ownership, 100% ownership? Is there a limit to 49%? Will there be a limit to how much foreign ownership there'll be and there'll be partners? Yes, they have discussed having Japanese partners, but the percentage by which it will have to be Japanese owned has yet to be determined. And the challenge is other casino companies, mostly from Macau and Las Vegas, they've seen this. They've seen the value of IRs because they've actually seen it. It's not some you know, shady, one of the 10,000 pachinko partners. They've seen how elegant um, these and how safe these environments are. And they're willing to go ahead and spend the you know, anywhere from $2 billion for a small up to, you know, $10 billion for a very large metropolitan area. $10 billion U.S. dollars is a lot of money. They're willing to go ahead and put a significant portion of that up. The question is that will there be enough Japanese partners or a consortium of Japanese companies that are willing to go ahead and also put up that money or go and get the loan for that money? And that is one of the challenges. So having a partner is a little bit of a tricky one. So number one, they don't know what the percentage of the ownership is. The second question is, will there be junkets or not? Junkets are these middlemen that gather huge, huge players. They collectively act like a quote unquote travel agent. They arrange for them to come and go ahead and make travel arrangements for them, bring them on board, and dedicate a room to them. And sometimes they help them transfer money. But because of money, money issues and money transfer issues and perhaps China not wanting to go ahead and leave the currency, They've not been doing so well in terms, there's been a lot of pressure as to, you know, exiting, taking the, some of the money from outside, from inside the China uh, into uh, foreign uh, places, including Japan, potentially in the future. And junkets are kind of a little bit on the shady side in that, you know, they engage in too much fun and, uh, you know, um, they, the, 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 color, the characters are sometimes a little bit too colorful. So most likely, my guess is that there will be minimum or almost no junkets, or if there is going to be junkets, it will be very much controlled. They will not enjoy some of the freedoms that they enjoy in Macau. So most likely, again, that has not been uh, written in law, but that seems to be where uh, they tend to be leaning. Um, the length of the licenses have yet not been known. In Macau, there are 20 year licenses, which are going to expire in a couple of years. 20 years is a very solid amount. You can go to a bank and say, hey, listen, lend me some money. Let me build it for two, three years and let me go ahead and have and enjoy it for the remaining 17, 18 years. In Japan, there's rumors, again, this has not been determined, but there's rumors that there's going to be a few different kinds of clocks running. There'll be a seven-year license, there may be a five-year license, which is too low because if it's gonna take you three or four years to build an integrated resort, and then you basically go ahead and borrow some money from a bank or attempt to borrow money, three, four, five billion dollars, and say half of what the cost would be in a big metropolitan area. The bank is going to basically be out of the money for the three or four year construction period and only have the money coming in two or three years. And then what's going to happen after that? Will there be a three year inspection period? If that's the case, what happens at the risk of you losing this? This is very different in a 20 year license. You want to go ahead and give long, you know, lengthy license periods, but then the public is not very happy by having a bunch of foreigners bring in this unknown entity called an integrated resort, which has a ca casino in it. They may not be very thrilled with having that long a lease given to a foreign company. So that's a very delicate balance. And finally, the biggest unknown is that the three cities have yet to be determined. Will there be small cities? Will there be medium cities? Will there be some of the large metropolitan areas? That makes a huge difference as to how successful they will be. 
and whether or not they're going to attract um, locals, uh, Japanese, they're going to attract some tourists. That's uh, also one of the, 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 the factors that have yet to be determined. And uh, hopefully we'll see within the next few months, unfortunately there's been a few delays, um, within the next few months, uh, months what those uh, cities will be and what some of these unknowns will, will be clarified. And how big of a market do you think it will be? Okay, that's a tricky question. I will try to attempt to answer it, but I just want to set up a few assumptions. Pre-COVID, let's assume we live in a pre-COVID world or a post-COVID world where things kind of come back to normal, right? We don't want to talk about what's happening right now. It's not reasonable. And let's assume that the relations between Japan and China or Japan and Korea will remain as peaceful and there'll be lots of transfers of, of, of visas and issuance of visas and travelers going back and forth. Because these are, these are going to be big determinants as to how successful they'll be. The next unknown is where are the size of the cities? Are you gonna give it to three tiny, tiny properties at, in small cities? Well, naturally then the size uh, of the small cities are not going to be able to withstand and generate that much market. But let's assume you're gonna go give it to a couple of the large metropolitan areas, like let's say Tokyo or Yokohama or Osaka, and maybe one medium or small size city. I'm guessing, and a lot of analysts believe that a large establishment, a large metropolitan area will have enough of a pull, whether it's through its own citizens or whether it's through the fact that Tokyo has tons and tons of flights coming in from all over Asia, that makes it much more convenient. They will generate anywhere between six to $10 billion a year just in gaming revenue. You take a couple of these and you add a medium city, which may make it make somewhere around three or $4 billion. At the high end, you're looking at something in the $20 billion range, 20 billion US dollar range. And at the low end, you're looking at somewhere, again, assuming two large cities and assuming a small, uh, medium to small city, you're looking at somewhere around uh, 12, $13 billion. So that range is somewhere around 12 to $20 billion. This is assuming that relations are as is, and we're talking about two or three years after, you know, the ramp up period has ended. Naturally, these are a little bit more optimistic than some of the other areas. I happen to be a bull. Uh, I happen to be uh, believe that Japan, it's not gonna be even a problem and they will be able to coexist with the pachinko parlors. I mean, again, a very unpleasant experience already generates $30 billion. How in the world do you not generate 10, 15, $20 billion by just having some world-class state-of-the-art uh, properties? So I think that's quite doable. It may take some time. And eventually, once you're talking about the second phase, which would be 10, 15 years down the line, when you have three, four more cities, then having 25, 30 billion dollars is reasonable. Again, by pair, way of comparison, Macau generates 36 billion dollars last year. The next highest uh, gaming market, Las Vegas um, Strip, generated six and a half billion dollars. I'm saying Japan is going to sit comfortably between the number six and a half and 36 billion. I think Japan will be comfortably in the middle, just sheer because of uh, the tendency for people to game. It's a big market. Pachinko at one point had maybe 15% of the adult population. Now maybe something like eight to 10% of the adult population engages in Pachinko gaming. Just imagine how it would be if you have something really elegant. So I'm definitely believe that Japan's gonna be big. Hi everyone, this is the end of part one with part two to follow in a few weeks. And that is all for myself and Aladab. We'd love to hear how you found this interview, so share your thoughts in the comments below and stay tuned for the next segment.